I'll go first, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Jamie Butler Dawson, and this is Lindsay Kreischer, and we work for the Center for Health, Work and Environment within the School of Public Health here at uh, University of Colorado. And today we're going to be talking about our partnership with a sugarcane business to try to protect workers in Latin America. Um, and first in this talk, we're going to be talking about kidney disease, and then we're going to be talking about other areas that we promote worker safety and health with um, the sugarcane business. So just an overview of our talk, I'm going to discuss chronic kidney disease of unknown origin, so it's called CKDU. Um, and then we're going to talk about the partnership and then the research we've been doing with the sugarcane business. And then how do we apply this research? So research to practice. So first, a little bit about CKDU. Um, it's a progressive loss of kidney function. The etiology is a mystery. We don't know the cause. It's not linked to traditional risk factors like diabetes or hypertension like we find in traditional chronic kidney disease in developed countries. Um, clusters of CKDU have emerged the past two decades. It's found um, in populations living in hot and humid regions like shown on the map here, the red dots are where high prevalence of CKDU has been observed. Um, it's found in poor agricultural communities. Male agricultural workers are heavily affected by CKDU. Um, and it's a relatively younger population um, for CKDU than traditional CKD. So like I said, causes are not clear. It does appear to be multifactorial. So we don't think there's just one cause of CKDU. It's probably multiple different things. So just a little bit about CKDU in Central America, where our research is focused. Um, it's heavily affected on the Pacific coast of Central America. Um, it's estimated to have caused over 60,000 deaths from 1997 to 2013, and I'm sure that's a huge underestimate. Um, the main risk factors for CKDU in this region um, have been communities that are, uh, that are in lower altitudes compared to higher altitudes. Um, and then in certain occupations, um, it seems to be heavily affected in sugarcane workers, um, also cotton and mining workers, and then we haven't found excess rates in, con or in um, coffee workers. And then it, it mainly affects males, like this figure showing mortality rate on the x-axis and then years on the, or, sorry, on the y-axis it's showing the mortality rate, x-axis is showing the years. So we have females and males on the right. It's just showing this extreme excess rate of disease among males in Nicaragua and El Salvador compared to other countries in the region and the United States. So this is just a figure showing possible mechanisms for development of CKDU. So one, propo one proposed mechanism is that people are, are exposed to toxins and toxicants, like pesticides, since it's found heavily in agricultural communities, heavy metals, silica. Another proposed mechanism is heat exposure, which could cause dehydration and or increased core body temperature. And these could be causing acute kidney injury and kidney inflammation, which could be leading to chronic CKDU, or also known as Mesoamerican nephropathy in the region. Another proposed mechanism are infectious agents. Um, this really hasn't been found to be a cause in the studies, um, but it was just hypothesized that it might be lepto or hantavirus. Uh, so PAHO and CDC put out a case definition in 2017 for surveillance purposes, and it's um, entails two abnormal kidney marker results. So if you have albuminuria, which is an albumin to creatinine ratio greater than 30, so you're spilling protein in your urine, and if you have an EGFR less than 60. And EGFR is just a measure of how well your kidneys are working. So if you have either of these two results greater than three months apart, and you also meet the following criteria. So you have no history of diabetes, hypertension, or other known causes of CKD. And it's if you're um, below the, the age of 60. Great, so um, as Jamie mentioned, we started a collaboration with a major sugarcane producer based in Central America that's called Pantaleon. And um, really the goal of this partnership um, we started about four years ago is to apply what's called total worker health principles. 
um, in order to both assess and then improve the overall health, safety, and well-being of the company's sugarcane workers in Guatemala. And since then, we've actually expanded to include the company's other operations that are in uh, Nicaragua and Mexico. So um, I'll explain total worker health a bit more, but it's basically an approach to um, integrate both traditional safety uh, programs that are common in the workplace with um, efforts to promote overall health. Um, so like chronic disease prevention programs like around diabetes or um, chronic kidney disease. And so the collaboration really initially focused on this issue of CKDU, but we've since expanded to include other issues that affect these workers that I'll be discussing further. And an important aspect of this collaboration is that uh, we have independent authority to conduct um, all of our analyses from the data that we collect and, um, in, and to publish any findings. So just um, by way of background, um, I'll describe a little bit about what sugarcane field work is like. So the sugarcane harvest lasts about six months from November till May. Uh, this company hires about 4,000 field workers annually to work the harvest, and they hire folks uh, who are from the local communities, it's called the, the Sona, um, that are around uh, the sugarcane mill, which is um, kind of in, in the coastal area of Guatemala. And um, they also hire uh, workers from the highlands, from highland communities who migrate down to the coast um, to live in dormitories provided by the company for the duration of the harvest. Um, and they're provided um, their pay and all of their meals and everything that they might need um, for those six months. And um, the company hires both, both people to cut the cane, but also uh, what we call production workers who um, are doing things like seeding and planting um, of, of the sugar cane, cutting the seeds. Um, to give you an idea of what uh, cane cutting is like, uh, this is extremely high exertion work. Um, people compare it to uh, basically running a marathon every day. These guys burn like 3,000, 4,000 calories per day. Um, they're out there in direct sunlight um, for about 10 hours per day, um, man manually using machetes to, to cut the cane um, and stack it into piles. Um, and they're paid by the amount of cane that they cut, uh, which on average is about six tons, but some workers will cut even more than that. Um, so even before we came on the scene, um, Pantaleon already had a number of practices in place um, to protect workers out in the field. So, all workers um, who are going to cut cane or, or work out in the fields are, um, have to go through a pre-employment health screening, and that includes a physical exam, um, basically to ensure that they're, that they're fit for the job since it is so, so physically intense. And then the company also has a, a cutoff um, of kidney function, so they have to have at least um, 90 uh, EGFR, um, so normal kidney function, in order to to, to, to work in the field um, for that season. So they have to do that every year. And then the company also has guidelines in place around hydration, rest, and shade. So um, at the time that we started working with Pantaleon, all workers were provided with at least two and a half liters of electrolyte solution, kind of like a salty Gatorade. Uh, all workers were supposed to drink at least 16 liters of water per day. And they also had to take at least three 20-minute breaks um, in the shade and one 60-minute break for lunch. The company also has a whole team of uh, field nurse aides who are out in the field. Um, they have uh, medications. They look for workers who might be in distress, um, ensuring that they're drinking their water, that they're staying hydrated, that kind of thing. And then they also have a team of, of physicians who who occupational health physicians who are out in the fields and also working at an on-site clinic that's free of charge for the workers. And then all workers um, as part of the job receive uh, personal protective equipment, including goggles, um, a hat, gloves, wrist and shin guards, and also uh, steel toe boots. Yeah, so um, actually the, the company mandates those, those guidelines. So they actually, using those nurses and physicians who are out in the fields, uh, they will actually do like random checks of urinary specific gravity to make sure that they're, they're hydrating the way that they're, they're supposed to. Um, so yeah, they have quite a few measures in place to, to control that in the field. Okay, great. I'm going to... Um 
go over the current research that we're doing with sugar cane workers in Guatemala. So just a high level overview of our own ongoing studies. Um, so we're doing observational intervention studies looking at hydration, rest, electrolyte intake, and nutrition. Um, we're also looking at causes and the etiology of CKDU. Uh, we've been doing surveillance studies and also mechanistic studies. So what are the pathways of injury? How is this being caused in the body? Um, and I'm just going to go over two studies today. Um, one's the intervention study and one's an etiology study. So for study one, uh, we did a hydration intervention. So one of the proposed hypotheses for CKDU is dehydration. So people are dehydrated and they're getting CKDU. So our initial questions for this research project were, so can we improve the hydration among sugar cane workers? And does kidney injury still occur, still occur when sugar cane workers are well hydrated? And if injury is still occurring, what are those other causes? So for our study, objectives, we wanted to implement an intervention which includes a wellness incentive and enhanced education on heat stress and hydration. The second objective was to evaluate changes in kidney function across the six-month season and then across the eight-hour work shift. Um, then our third objective was to investigate associations with daily kidney injury and daily heat stress, heat exposure, hydration, and other risk factors. So for the intervention study, we had a um, total of 500 study participants. And we came in in February, March, and April and collected biomarkers at the beginning of the work shift. So we would come in, before they started working, we would collect creatinine and a dipstick urinalysis. And then we would come back about nine hours later and collect the same measures and also do a survey of their 24-hour recall. So what were you taking today? Did you take any medications? Um, did you smoke today? How much did you drink? Um, and we did this at three different time points. And then the study also included an intervention, like I said. So we increased education on heat stress and the risk of dehydration. So we handed out brochures that we made, uh, and we taped these brochures to the buses. We gave it to the nurse aides and the doctors and also the workers. Um, and then we also did like a urine color chart to all the workers um, so they could see from the color of their pee if they were dehydrated or not. And then we had an incentive for hydration. Um, so we gave them a raffle token at the beginning of the work shift if they were hydrated. And then at the end of the work shift, if they maintained their hydration, we gave them another token. And then at the end of the work shift, we did a prize raffle with tokens. So if they had tokens, they put it into the bucket and then they drew prizes and they could get like soccer balls, toothbrushes, toothpaste, clothes, shoes, and it was a lot of fun for the workers. Um, so this figure just shows how hot it is in the field. Um, so we have our study days on the x-axis, so we have 24 study days. And then on the y-axis, we have a measure called wet bulb globe temperature. And that just is a measure of how hot it feels. So it incorporates temperature, humidity, radiation, wind speed. Um, and so here we have the blue line shows the average wet bulb globe temperature and the red line shows the max. And at 30, I have a red dotted line that is the U.S. OSHA heat exposure threshold. So if temperatures in the U.S. go above 30, you're only supposed to be working 15 minutes of an hour, which is definitely not the case, or it can be the case in Central America. It's hot all the time. It's above 30 most of the day and most of the season. So some of the results um, from this hydration intervention study, we found um, a couple risk factors for having acute kidney injury. So if they started the season uh, with reduced kidney function, they were more likely to have these acute kidney injuries throughout the season. And then we also found a significant interaction between dehydration and NSAID use. So if they were dehydrated and they were taking NSAID, it's kind of like a double hit to your kidneys. And then we did define that um, electrolyte solution intake was protective. So the more electrolytes they took in during the day, the less likely they were going to have a kidney injury. And then also hydration. So conclusions from that study was that almost all the study workers were well hydrated. However, 50% of the workers had acute kidney injury across the work shift at all three time points. Um, they had low electrolytes in their blood. So our conclusion was that while hydration is protective, it doesn't prevent all kidney injury. Uh, so other factors appear to be contributed to kidney injury, such as maybe a combination, multifactorial, like NSAID use and being dehydrated. 
The second study I'm going to go over is an environmental exposure assessment we conducted last year. So we analyzed nephrotoxins in the water, urine, and air, and also toenails. Um, so with the water, we collected water samples from main drinking sources at the workplace and also in their homes during the off season. We looked at metals and agrochemical levels. Um, and then we collected urine samples from several um, cane cutters during the, the work season and off season. And then we recently looked at air in the workplace, um, looking at particulate matter, silica, and glyphosate in air samples. Um, and then uh, we did collect toenails in the homes uh, for the analysis of heavy metals. So Lindsay was lucky enough to be a part of that study. Uh, so for results for the drinking water quality, so we looked at um, several nephrotoxin metals. So we looked at arsenic, cadmium, ur uranium, mercury, and these are all naturally occurring metals due to the volcanic activity in the region. And then we also looked at 2,4-D and glyphosate, which is also known as Roundup. Uh, so results for, from the uh, analysis of the water samples. So we found that metals and agrochemical levels are below U.S., EPA, and WHO standards. And we did find 2,4-D and glyphosate were detected in all the samples, in all, in all the water samples. So results for the urine analysis. So we collected um, 83 urine samples from king cutters, and we found that in all the urine samples, there was detectable levels of arsenic and nickel, and we also found high levels of cadmium and lead in their urine. Um, so just comparing it to a reference population, the median concentrations of total arsenic, cadmium, lead, and uranium were higher than a, a referent random sample of Mexican-Americans from uh, U.S. in Hames survey. So I'm just explaining these data, we're seeing that, okay, low levels in the drinking water so, and high levels in the urine samples. So water may not be the main source for heavy metals and agrochemicals. So our next question was, what are the sources of, of exposure? What are the other sources should we be looking at? So we decided to do a pilot assessment of area and personal air quality. So we went to the sugar cane field, and so they burned their sugar cane prior to cutting. So you'll have a field being burned, and then next door in the neighboring field, the, the cane cutters are right there cutting it. And it's just high levels of smoke while they're burning the sugar cane. So we wanted to look at air quality. So we had um, study, staff, study staff actually wear the personal air samplers and walk around the sugar cane fields, and the air samplers were in their breathing zone. So we could see as a proxy for workers what they could be exposed to. And we found that workers were exposed to extremely high levels of particulate matter, as well as ex exposure to some metals. And we did find that amorphous silica accounted for 17% of the mass in the samples. So silica is naturally occurring in the soils and in the sugarcane plant. So when they burn it, it seems to be released into the air. Um, and we did find that um, there were trace amounts of crystalline silica, which is a known nephrotoxin. So this is kind of shocking news that this is what we're finding, that workers may be exposed to silica while they're working all day. So the next questions that we're asking is, what are the community exposures, and how do they contribute to kidney injury? And so we just submitted an R01 to go into the communities and look at their environmental exposures. Great. So I'm going to sort of switch gears now and discuss some of the other uh, sort of total worker health related projects that we've been working on with Pantaleon. Uh, so again, our initial focus has been um, on the kidney disease research, um, but sort of out of that, we've been helping the company to uh, conduct um, active kidney health surveillance, so helping them enhance uh, their measurement of incidence and prevalence of kidney injury and chronic disease. Um, both across the work shift um, and across the season and across multiple seasons. Um, we've been working with them on enhancing their hydration program, especially around electrolytes, and I'll be discussing more about that, um, as well as around nutrition and hearing conservation and noise mitigation. And then um, I won't discuss it today, but the company is also interested in looking at um, smoking cessation programs 
injury and illness surveillance, and um, they're also interested in uh, training their leaders and uh, managers around how to be better um, promoters of health and wellness and safety um, for their employees. So each year, um, following um, the field work that we do with Pantaleon, we quickly analyze all the data that we've collected in the field and uh, uh, turn those into actionable recommendations that the company can implement um, into their budgets and um, into uh, the next harvest season to better protect their workers. And so, um, as Jamie was mentioning, some of our key results from um, the research study that we did in 2016, 2017, was that um, the workers were well hydrated, but they had very low serum electrolytes. And having low electrolytes can lead to conditions like hypokalemia and hyponatremia um, that can be really dangerous. Uh, we, despite them being well hydrated, um, there was a high incidence of cross-shift acute kidney injury um, that was worrisome. And, um, but we did find that being well hydrated and consuming um, higher levels of electrolytes seemed to be protective against acute kidney injury. And so some of the recommendations that came out of those findings was um, first to implement a more protective hiring cutoff around kidney function at pre-employment because we found that workers who started the season with lower um, worse kidney function did worse, had more rapid declines earlier in the season um, than those workers who, in kidney function, than those workers who started um, with normal kidney function. And um, as part of that, uh, we also recommended the company start implementing mid-harvest kidney health surveillance. So prior to this, they were just doing the pre-employment screening, but um, we thought it was important that they, all, that they also implement another follow-up um, about three months later, halfway through the season, because that would allow clinicians to be able to catch those people who are, who are rapidly declining and either take them out of work, provide them treatment, education, um, before, you know, while the disease may still be reversible, while the injury is still reversible. And then uh, we also recommended the implementation of two different intervention trials, and I'll be describing um, the one that was around um, electrolytes. So uh, first, the electrolyte hydration program. So um, as I mentioned, the company was already providing about two and a half liters of electrolytes to workers each day. So uh, we proposed a three-week uh, pilot intervention to increase um, electrolytes during the workday. So week one was kind of business as usual. So they provided the workers two and a half liters. And um, we collected blood and urine to assess their hydration and their electrolyte levels. Week two, they were provided um, every day five liters, and then week three, they provided um, 10 liters, and each week collecting the same clinical measures. And what we found was that electrolytes um, levels in the blood remained stable um, each week. So uh, uh, with increasing electrolytes, their, their levels um, remained balanced. Uh, importantly, the consumption of more electrolytes seem to prevent muscle damage, so muscle breakdown. Um, when you're con conducting heavy exercise, it's normal to have a certain degree of muscle, of muscle breakdown. That's normal, but if you have too much, that can lead to a condition called rhabdomyolysis, which is very dangerous. Um, so that was something um, very promising that we were seeing, that with each week of more electrolytes, there was, we were seeing less muscle breakdown among the workers. And then we also did a survey at the end of each week, and um, with more electrolytes, the workers uh, reported feeling better, having more energy, um, with increasing suero is the local term for the electrolyte solution. And we found that 10 to, five to 10 liters is really um, the sweet spot um, for the, the quantity. And so um, the, we also recommended for logistical purposes that they start using um, a powder electrolyte solution and having the workers mix it directly in their five liter thermos that's provided by the company, um, rather than these um, half-liter pre-mixed packets that they were distributing prior to this. Um, just for logistical reasons, you know, they have to get these electrolytes out there to 4,000 workers every day, and so this made it a lot more feasible to do that. I think it, it definitely was cheaper, too, yeah. Um, so... Um, as, as a result of the successful pilot, we recommended they uh, roll out the program more broadly to all of their workers in Guatemala, and they asked us to come in and, and do basically an audit of the implementation of, of this new protocol of 5 to 10 liters of electrolytes for all their field workers, and then they could drink however much free water 
they wanted to in addition to the electrolytes. Um, and so the way we did that was we trained all the field nurses who were out in the fields um, to basically be our boots on the ground and make sure that the workers were getting the electrolytes they were supposed to be getting um, since this was a big logistical lift um, that, that the operations team had to undertake. Uh, so they were sort of our, our eyes on the ground. And we also came in at three different time points during the season to conduct a direct audit ourselves to make sure we were seeing the clinical results that we were expecting to see. And then in the other operations in Nicaragua and Mexico, uh, we evaluated their existing hydration program because each country kind of has its own program going on. So we thought we'd just come in and see what, what the baseline is uh, at, in Nicaragua and Mexico and then make recommendations from there. And again, at each time point, we assessed the same things, hydration, uh, blood and urine electrolytes, muscle breakdown um, through creatine kinase and uh, kidney function. And we also conducted worker surveys um, to you know, verify that this was still an acceptable amount of electrolytes to receive. And so the result of that audit, um, first of all, in, in Guatemala, uh, once the company really had, once the operations team really had a um, standard opera operating procedures in place, a protocol, um, the access uh, to electrolytes um, really improved. And, and we saw, we confirmed the results of the pilot, basically. Um, the the uh, workers had, had stable levels of electrolytes and less muscle breakdown. And then our recommendations for this coming season include um, that Nicaragua and Mexico implement this new hydration program because um, a lot of them were not well hydrated or had low levels of electrolytes and high levels of muscle breakdown. And so they're actually going to be implementing this new protocol um, in those countries this year and auditing the implementation. Um, the Mexico mill also requires, um, we found they need more hydration education, maybe through um, the incentive program that we that we did that Jamie mentioned in Guatemala. And uh, they'll be doing additional audits in Guatemala as well, just to make sure um, we continue to see um, the same effects. So now I'll move into what we're doing around nutrition. Yeah, Steve. Mm-hmm. Totally, yeah. Um, so w since we're looking at acute kidney injury across the work shift, we do have to take into account maybe some of that inflammation and creatinine is due to muscle breakdown. Um, but we've been talking with nephrologists about this, and they don't really think there's a lot of contribution of the creatinine to, of, of creatine kinase to the rise in creatinine. So we don't, I, I mean, we've, we've analyzed the data looking at rhabdo and risk factors for kidney injury, and we haven't found associations with rhabdo. Plus, we're finding CKDU in communities also. So there's higher prevalences among women who aren't doing agricultural work, but they do live in agricultural communities. Um, and then there's been recent studies looking at adolescents and how they have, you know, increased rates of CKDU among adolescents. So it, our thoughts are that it's not directly related to the muscle breakdown, to the strenuous work. Yeah, that's... That's a, that's a very important question, and we've been trying to get at that. So... Um, a lot of time, a lot of times when we talk to nephrologists, they say, "So what? You know, like you get a, you get acute kidney injury when you run a marathon, you know, and it's reversible." But we're seeing patterns where if you're having these big fluctuations in creatinine acutely on a daily basis, those that have more fluctuations are more likely to decline in kidney function across the season. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I run a small NGO in Nicaragua. Out of the 15 families that have been involved, with, two of the farmers have died. And these are most of the And when you're down there in the Cambridge season, every place, you know, not, not, it's 
understand they're much worse than when we came here. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even 20, 10 miles away, it's the air is there. And I know that they'll spray the rock on the, on the growing season. They spray right on them. And they're just spraying spray the spray the people. So I'm just wondering if you can press this part of the herbicide. You want to discuss a little bit grant next year? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, first, that's why we wanted to look at the, the water samples at the work site to see if there were high levels of glyphosate and other agrochemicals that they're applying. And we are finding it in the urine samples uh, of the workers. Um, it's not, I don't think it's the silver bullet cause of CKDU. Like, I don't think that's the one thing. I think there's other things going on. Um, and then on your point with the, the air exposure, how it's all over. So we, we actually just put in a grant to look at community air exposures. So we're looking at the work site exposures in the air and also going into the community and measuring what they're exposed to in the community. Great, so around uh, nutrition. So the company asked us to come in and basically do like a baseline nutritional status assessment of their workers. Um, again, they were already providing a um, certain amount of food, at least three meals a day, to the workers that live on site who come from the highlands. But uh, they want to know, you know, is, are we providing them enough food? Are they losing weight across the season? And how are the local workers doing um, who live in the local communities and have to bring their own food? Um, so we did this assessment actually in partnership with a local Guatemala City uh, University, Universidad Francisco Marroquin. Uh, we recruited about 203 cane cutters um, and looked at them at two different time points during the season, January and April. And half of those workers were from the Sona, from the local communities, and half were from the highlands. We uh, looked at anthropometric measures, so using um, like skin, skin fold calipers. To, um, to look at um, uh, muscle and, and fat mass. And then uh, we also measured kidney function. We did an assessment of their dietary intake to try to determine exactly what they're eating in terms of calories, protein, carbohydrates, fats. We did an assessment of food security and um, a household survey in the Zona communities um, to see what kind of community risk factors may be at play. And then we also did a survey of food preferences among the workers to kind of try to prepare for um, future intervention. And so uh, what we found was that about half of the workers are losing weight across the season, um, which is very troubling, um, especially since they're losing not just fat, but also muscle mass during the season. And we found that the zona, the local workers, were at the highest risk for these negative changes. Um, we think possibly due in part to um, the fact that they seem to be consuming fewer calories, they seem to have lower food security in general, and there may have been other household risk factors that could be at play. And so what we've recommended that the company do this year um, that they're working on now is designing and uh, piloting a new nutrition intervention to provide um, a higher quantity, but also higher quality of calories um, for all of their workers. They're now going to also include those Zona workers who were um, in the past having to bring their food from home. Um, and we've recommended they pilot test um, different food recipes to verify that the workers like the food. Um, since there was a wide variety of responses, some people want um, something hot, cold, sweet, salty in terms of um, snacks and food. So um, they're actually getting ready to implement um, that new intervention uh, with the upcoming season. And so now I'll sort of discuss uh, the hearing conservation program that we've also been implementing. So this is actually a collaboration with um, a group up at the University of Northern Colorado led by uh, Dr. Deanna Meinke in the um, Department of Audiology. So uh, Dr. Meinke and a team of her students, her graduate students, came down to Guatemala about one year ago in December and conducted a noise dosimetry. Or, um, they collected 51 different time-weighted average noise exposures from um, a variety of employees from 17 different jobs actually now we're inside the mill. Um, so sugarcane production is very is a very heavy industrial process. There's a lot of heavy machinery that produces a lot of, a lot of noise, a lot of vibration, steam. Um, it's also really hot in the mill, I'll mention. 
Um, and most of these mills, at least in Latin America, were built um, a long time ago, uh, so before there was really much concern about uh, noise exposure. And so this graph, um, and I borrowed this from, um, from Ashley Stumpf, who's one of Dr. Meinke's graduate students, um, shows the mean dose of noise um, that, that was collected from each of the, the different jobs. And um, on the uh, y-axis, you can see the, the average dose as a percent um, across the work shift. And on the um, x-axis is uh, all the different job uh, categories that were collected. And the red line is 100%. So that's really the limit that's been set um, both by the Guatemalan Occupational Safety and Health Administration and also um, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health here in the US, NIOSH, um, for a workday. And so you can see here, um, almost all the jobs are uh, drastically exceeding um, the recommended exposure limit uh, per day. And uh, one of the jobs in the evaporator um, inside the mill is actually at over 15,000%. Um, didn't even fit on this graph. So that's a, a lot of very dangerous levels of noise. And so, um, as I said, almost all the workers are, are overexposed. So um, the permissible limit set by NIOSH and in Guatemala is 85 uh, decibels. Um, uh, time-weighted average over the eight-hour shift. Um, so really, all these workers need to be, um, here in the U.S., they'd all be required to be enrolled in a hearing loss prevention program. And those workers who were being really overexposed above 100 decibels um, in the evaporator and juice extraction divisions um, require even further uh, precautions. And so what the company's done since then, just in the past year, um, all employees were already being provided um, earplugs. Um, but they're, they've conducted more trainings, making sure that everyone's using the devices properly. And um, those guys who require further protection are also receiving um, uh, dual protection, so earmuffs in addition to earplugs. And they've also implemented some administrative controls, so trying to rotate workers more um, to other parts of the mill and finding other ways to reduce the hours of exposure that they have. Um, Dr. Meinke and her team, while they were there doing the dosimetry, they also conducted um, audiometry training and certified all of Pantaleon's company clinicians as uh, hearing conservationists. So they're all now certified um, to, to uh, conduct a hearing conservation program. Pantaleon also um, hired, uh, brought in a, a noise control engineer. So. Um, from the U.S., so he came in and did a noise control survey in the mill um, and was able to identify and help the company um, implement engineering controls to help mitigate uh, the major noise sor sources inside the mill. And then uh, really right now, um, the company is implement, um, installing new equipment, a new audiometer, a new hearing booth at the mill, and in December, Dr. Meinke and her team will be returning again to um, help uh, make sure all the equipment is installed and run all the employees through audiometry um, to really launch the new program. So that's been an exciting project. Um, and actually, Ashley Stumpf, um, led and mentored by Dr. Meinke, uh, we just put out this paper um, right here in the International Journal of Audiology. It just came out this week. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about um, the work that was done on this project, um, you can find that there. So just to wrap up, um, again, this total worker health approach has really allowed us to be able to um, take into consideration all the different um, health-related concerns and safety concerns that affect these workers. So we really started you know, on physical health, chronic disease, uh, with the kidney disease um, issue and environmental concerns. Um, but now we're, we're actually, um, just this past year, we, uh, the company asked us to do basically a diagnostic of the culture of health and safety across the company. So we did a survey with um, everyone from top management to, to cane cutters to, to assess what's the current culture of health and safety. Do people feel safe? Do they feel like their, um, their supervisors are concerned about their health and well-being? And so as a result of that, um, we actually are developing programs around mental health, stress management, um, sleep, fatigue. These were the other issues that, that came up as a result of doing that assessment. And so those are kind of a um, uh, preview of coming attractions, I guess. So um, there are a lot of different people on, on this team, um, not just Jamie and I, um, both from the University of Colorado and, and from Pantaleon, the whole medical team um, who've made 
all of this work possible. And of course, we also want to thank uh, the workers who, who have made um, really all of this work possible. So thank you. We'll take um, any additional questions. Yeah, we, we are actually. It seems seems to be the case, at least in, in the data we've analyzed so far, that the local workers, the SONA workers, seem to be higher risk. Um, and so the question is, um, there are a lot of differences between the ZONA and Altiplano workers. Um, you know, we're not really sure what's mm -hmm. happening at home. Yeah, um, what they're doing during the off season um, could be different. And we also know that there are genetic differences, potentially. Those from the Altiplano tend to be more indigenous than those um, from, from the SONA. So there are a lot of different factors that need to be teased apart, but it's a good question. Yeah, um, I can partially answer that question. I know that the company does um, collect data just in the clinic from folks who are coming in with asthma. Um, I don't know the exact number of workers that they've diagnosed with asthma and that they're treating, um, but it is something that's there. Um, and I, I can also say that at least in Guatemala and Nicaragua, that respiratory illnesses are right at the top in, in terms of the issues that people are coming to the clinic with um, each year. So it's one of the most important concerns. But what's causing the respiratory illness, we're not quite sure if it's influenza or other, other things. Yeah, and we, when we were talking with um, leadership at Pantaleon, we told them about Dan's surveillance study, and they did seem very interested, given that there's a high rate of influenza and respiratory illness.
I think we may, yeah, from the clinic. Mm -hmm. No, I think what, what's been observed is that the men have significantly higher rates of CKDU, but we've also seen excess rates in the women and children in these heavily affected, like, hot zones. Um, so, yeah, that makes us want to look at the community because we're like, well, it's not just work, like sugarcane work. There's something else going on, and it could be that they're all exposed in the community, and then the men go to work and they get dehydrated or, you know, like there's another hit to their kidneys while they're working. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were thinking with the, the local workers, because they're having higher, you know, they have a higher prevalence of CKDU and of the acute kidney injury, it's maybe it is because of, you know, they're, they're more urban, so there's more pollutants that they're exposed to. Yeah, there's also, um, we're interested also in the, the cook stoves as well, that, you know, most of the communities in the Sona, they keep the fire burning all day inside the home, and so that's another potential community exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Jennifer. Other questions? Great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Starts off, and then before you oh, know, it's been two or three years. It's this huge project, right? and you guys did an incredible job. Thank you. Yeah, the collaboration started with a message to our uh, center director, Jennifer Lee, and through LinkedIn. Oh, I hear you're doing an assessment with the banana workers in Sapino. What can you do with our workers? So, yeah. Three and a half years later, yeah. <laughs>